Hello, everybody. Welcome to the training, learning, and development community. Happy Monday to you. So glad to see everyone here. Let's see. Mike Peacock is in the house. Mike, it is so good to have you. Nice to see you. Jenny Irving. Kara was in for a little bit, but she had to bail. Um, I don't know. It seems like, Ian, you're somewhat popular. Um, people I wouldn't know. go that far, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely died down since I deleted Twitter. <laughs> Is that what it is? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I'll just say it's that. <laughs> <laughs> Darn that Twitter. Uh -huh. um, let's see who else we got. We got Mike here. Laura Middlesworth is here. Kim, Leticia, Jennifer, Bobby Vernon. Nice to see you. Kitsal is here. Kelly. Oh, Joe Cook, Julia Sheehy. Gosh, we got a good group. This is nice. And it might be what, uh, like Ian mentioned earlier, it might be that clickbaity title that he suggested for our conversation this morning yeah it's all it's all it's technically my fault that it's clickbait so if anybody gets mad <laughs> wow lewis is now going the clickbait route uh no blame me uh <laughs> well i never do it i never do it but i thought you know what this is ian so we're gonna do it this time we're gonna do it this time um <laughs> why training teams are a waste yeah which is really actually I mean, as clickbaity as it is, it's very, very fun. Um, yeah, because yeah, it's, it's this a good is, thought exercise. This is what everybody does for a living: is they do this, you know, they do this training team thing. Right. So, um, yeah. But I have like a short intro for you that I kind of put together using your LinkedIn profile, and honestly, I kind of, I tried to use ChatGPT to figure out if I could find more I've been about using you. It like crazy, it work. totally yeah, fine. <laughs> you were like a uh, pharmaceutical company instructional designer in charge of like thousands of uh, thousands of of team right. and I was like hmm that, that doesn't that's not right that's different from what right. that to. seems weird <laughs> <laughs> I love that they I love that in the industry they say oh the AI is just hallucinating and it's like that's what I that's what I want to rely on something that occasionally hallucinates cool. <laughs> Right. So this is what I did come up with. I don't know. There might actually still be some um, some vestiges of the chat GPT in it, but I have Ian Crook is an experienced L&D professional based in Bristow, Virginia. He currently serves as an, as an instructional designer at Amazon, where he is responsible for taking source material from either the training specialists or the SMEs and finding the best method to produce training from both learning retention and cost slash time perspectives. Um, Ian is an active participant in the L&D community, having contributed to industry events and publications. Is that last sentence correct? One hot second. I think my headphones have just kicked out. Oh. It be anything with me unless it, like, had some sort of weird audio issue. <laughs> I swear. All right. I just think I may have to restart a audio device. Okay. Um, Y'all can still hear me, though, right? We can hear you. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Let's see. Speakers. And I'm getting lots of emails. I better turn those off real quick. I think it's everybody signing up. Right, isn't it? Can you hear us at all now, Ian, or no? Okay. Uh, I may have to restart. Uh, like I may have to rejoin in because it's just not picking up my my speakers anymore. Uh, okay, whatever reason. So let me go ahead and do that real quickly. Got it. Um, I am seeing a comment in here. Joe Cook is saying Teams is a waste. Zoom and Adobe Connect are better. Um, that is interesting. Um, we should talk about that sometime, Joe. I would like to learn more about why Teams is a waste. I haven't used it myself. I actually I was in a meeting in, using it last week, but uh, other than that experience, because it was just a meeting, so I wouldn't know. Um, let's see. <laughs> it's all why headphones are a waste. Um, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm excited about talking to Ian on this one. Uh, I Many of you may know that I sent out a request to do some interviews with folks like um, on the member side. And uh, 
the last time I did this last fall, I think I got three responses to, <laughs> to doing any showcases or topics or anything like that. And I was really bummed. And so we haven't been doing these types of events in Crowdcast for a while. But then um, I sent out another one. And now we're basically booked um, up until August. And my schedule is busier than I had expected. So um, so that is interesting. Um, but I am actually, here's a little, little tidbit. I'm having problems with Crowdcast. The last um, few meetings we've had here in crowdcast i've been unable to download the uh the recordings afterwards and so for instance last week's recording with um with with alan not to chew on pdf accessibility i couldn't get to and so they're trying to get it to me but um i might have to be looking for, i might have to look for a crowdcast alternative so we'll see what happens all right ian all right, can can you hear me you got your earbuds in or or what are they what are their air air i can't remember mm. yeah those things. and you can hear me right i can hear you awesome okay wow it wouldn't like people who know me it wouldn't be me if literally <laughs> if there literally wasn't some sort of tech issue i've got such <laughs> a weird setup um all right so how about this let can we just get into it ian can absolutely. i can you tell us why training teams are a waste or or not and i'm just gonna um let me see i'm gonna try this here where i pin my into the okay there we go okay. so i'm gonna let you take over and let me know if you need me to do anything yeah go for it all right so when we're talking about waste first off i'm speaking strictly from a lean six sigma sort of mindset um waste is it can be summarized in a way that says like all right <clears throat> what doesn't provide direct value to um the end customer now the argument uh the argument that comes from is that like you know training teams when training teams do come in it's like you know we're helping that end you know, the end value streams or the end uh, value props to provide that value to the end customer. But that's still technically indirect. And that's kind of the the thought process that really the title of this entire discussion talks about is that training teams are technically an indirect towards that value that companies and organizations give to a uh, to, to to make the company money. Um, and that's another thing I kind of also have to kind of do a, a quick thing as well, is that this doesn't necessarily apply towards academia. Um, this is primarily towards companies that, uh, you know, private sector type stuff. So when operations is, th is thinking about lean, uh, it's all about maximizing value and minimizing waste in their processes. I'm not going to go into every single bit of what one of those wastes are. Uh, however, there are ones that I do want to touch base on because I, I believe they touch on training specifically. And one of those is logistics. Now, most people, when they think logistics, it's focused on moving a product from one end to another, whether it's Amazon putting stuff in boxes and delivering it to your house, or whether it's, you know, something's going to a warehouse, a distribution center, uh, trucks on the road, airplanes in the sky, that type of stuff. And that's not, that's not the whole story. Because really what training teams are is the logistics of knowledge transfer uh, to your organization. And that's kind of the big aha moment that I personally had, where it was just like, oh, I need to kind of change how I'm thinking about working with, um, you know, working with org leaders. Because a lot of the time, especially if you're a training team that's associated with an operations side of thing, they are focused on the direct value that they give their customers. They are not focused so much on, you know, are, is, is the, I don't know, is the desk set up right? Unless it applies directly to reduce waste towards 
uh, providing value. Uh, and the same thing goes with training. Um, they're focusing on their employees providing value. And if the blocker to providing that value or increasing that value is, you know, they don't know, they don't know the material, they don't know a certain thing, or they aren't exhibiting certain behaviors uh, to provide that value efficiently, that's where the training team starts coming in. And we provide and we facilitate the, the logistics of knowledge transfer so that we can enact that you know, overarching change within within an organization. And then we measure ourselves against that change so that we can prove that like, although, you know, we, we have to exist, so to speak, uh, it is a situation where we say, you know, we, we provide more value existing than we do not existing. So there are kind of two aspects that I think we should all be focusing on in a training team and that there's the waste that's present or that's present in operations. And again, that kind of goes into standard Lean Six Sigma. Um, but then there's also like the waste in the training itself, which can include things like unnecessary content, redundant material, um, unnecessary administrative tasks, inefficient delivery methods. So touching on the waste inside of operations and how we're supposed to partner with things like, you know, global process owners and the change management folks um, and stuff is we're supposed to have that mindset too. Like how are we helping the organization provide value more efficiently and more effectively to the customer? And that could be, um understanding and finding those knowledge gaps that only attack the behaviors that are necessary to meet that objective instead of giving a whole curriculum so to speak so case point and example is i think everyone here has run into a circumstance where they've either created or made a 101 class, a 102 class, a 103 class, advanced courses, job eight, like this whole, this whole curriculum, this whole degree path learning journey um, where they start as a new hire and they have to go through it. And the example I'm going to do is a, like a sales position. If the hiring bar and the job role guideline and what they were hired for says that they need to be set up for, you know, negotiating and they know those negotiating skills uh, to a fine, you know, to, to specificity because they're getting hired to the org and hopefully the org is looking at like what they need to fill in the gaps to provide additional value and to grow and scale. We should be focusing on, all right, well, the org doesn't need a foundations to negotiations training. Um, that's more of a performative issue instead of a training issue. And that's more of a discussion that happens between their manager and the individual instead of just doing a carpet, you know, a carpet blanks training that says, all right, well, you know, two people had issues with negotiating. So everybody in this thousand person org is now going to have to take fundamentals of negotiating. Um, and it's, it's a huge waste of everyone's time because from an operational perspective, if they're getting taken away from doing their job and providing that direct value to the customer, um, they are not uh, effective. And we as a training team are facilitating that. And from an operations as like an operations manager or an operations director, if they were to kind of come into that circumstance and, and look at it and say, well, I thought we hired people who were already good at negotiating. Why are they spending 20 plus hours in negotiating training? Like what's going on? Um, and then, you know, the training team has to, like, facilitate answering that. And a lot of the time, it's scrambling what you can to justify your existence, being like, no, no, this is good, this is good. They have to know the basics before the whatever. But, like, it's still not communicating 
that big question of, okay, but we hired people that were already supposed to have negotiating skills. Are we not meeting that requirement? And if we're not, like, that's maybe now it's a training opportunity towards the recruitment process. Like, how do we hire people who have good negotiating skills? Um, and that can help form the basis of the 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 purpose behind uh, negotiation fundamentals and stuff. So, really going into operational mindset. That's that's the big focus. Is why why do they need to take this training in the first place when they could be providing value? Going into the training team aspect, you know, we've got a million tools in our Batman utility tool belt. Uh, to meet the needs of the customer, um, whether it's job aids, podcasts, e-learnings, uh, videos, instructor-led, virtual instructor, you know, we've got we've got a ton of capability uh, as producers of content, and it's our job to make sure that not only are we producing the correct content for our audience, but that we're also applying lean methodology to the creation of that content. Uh, for instance, uh, this is going to be a little bit anecdotal because I don't have the numbers next to me anymore. Um, <clears throat> but just having templates, just having basic templates set up can save anywhere between 800 to 900 ish dollars per hour of training development, um, just because it was built out beforehand. And that right there is, I mean, that's easy pickings for just making your team more efficient and, you know, building, you know, things like building out templates so that when a customer does come in and say, hey, we actually have a behavioral problem, you do your needs analysis and say like, okay, yeah, no, this is actually a behavioral problem that um, we need to address to meet business goals. We can turn around and work with those templates and say, all right, well, here's the training. Let's solve the problem as quickly as possible because it all falls back onto going back from the operational perspective, getting people as value focused and value driving as possible in your organization. Um, so <clears throat> when, you know, all of this is all said and good, like, yes, we should be doing our job effective. We should be doing our job efficiently. Uh, but it always kind of goes back into that question of well, how do we measure it? Like, where's where's the measurements? And, you know, if you follow Kirkpatrick's models of evaluation, it's like, okay, well, how do we get level four? How do we get level four? It's always how do we get level four? It's the holy grail of training is, like, how did we impact with dollar figures? Um, on operations and that goes back into well what what does operations really care about right now operations um i can guarantee you operations will have kpis that are tied directly to value generation whether that's sales conversions whether that's widgets produced whether that's whatever there will be direct indicators to say like, all right, this team is doing well. And when I say KPI, I don't mean every metric known to, you know, known to existence. KPIs are key performance indicators, which is just a single metric or two that determine how well a process is going. Um, and as a training team, we need to be latching on to those business and organizational KPIs and we also need to understand and know the the big impact towards p0 goals um mission statements vision statements you know one year plans three year plans five year plans and <clears throat> focus in on what those KPIs are and what metrics support that KPI so that we can say all right if the goal is to increase sales by 10% this year, and one of the KPIs is sales conversions, 
And here are the metrics that support conversion. And that could mean, you know, whether things get updated in the CRM tool, automated emails getting sent out and read, whatever those look like for your organization. Those are the things that we have to start tying towards or tying our metrics as training teams to the operational side, because it's that translation that operations understands the, the real value and the force multiplier that our training teams can provide for their organization. Like that's kind of like the cool thing about what training is in general is like, you know, if we save five minutes on a process through a small behavioral change and that five minute process is sent out to, you know, a thousand plus person org, like we're justifying our existence in a single training um, for like a single headcount. So we'd be crazy not to associate even more and really kind of dig our heels into, all right, what does operations care about? What are the things that they measure to determine success? And how are we determining our own success to our organization's success to those determining factors too? Um, and that kind of goes into, it kind of ties back to the making content that only bridges that gap. Uh, a an example I like to give is you you typically don't teach handymen how to use a hammer. You, you teach them how to build the shed if that's you know if they have a new design, but you know you'd be wasting not only your development time but also the organization's or the hand you know the handyman's time um, on something that they should already know you know coming into the coming into a job. Um, going back in going back in terms of measurement, so once we determine how to connect the dots between like, all right, this is what the business actually cares about. We need to start focusing on that gap assessment. Whether that's referencing it against current state, you know, do a survey, job shadows or something to get some of that uh, qualitative information um, going into that and mixing that with what the expectations are for the job, uh, the job role, we can get an idea of like, okay, well, here's, here's what the business is currently capable of doing. And the job role itself says they need to be meeting these certain types of behaviors. And we have now partnered with the organization to say like, okay, here are your KPIs, metrics, and your goals and stuff for, you know, any given amount of time. We should be able to then extrapolate what are the specific behaviors we need to kind of sink our teeth into to solve that problem, to solve, to, to bridge that gap. Um, then, of course, we apply what we do best, instructional design methodologies. What's the best way of doing it? Um, making sure that we're chunking it, making sure that, uh, you know, if, we, if you follow Mayor's 13, that it's not visually disruptive, increase retention. Like, we know how to make content typically that says, all right, the learner learned something, we can measure that. But tying it back to the operations is what's more important because that's what operations cares about. And especially in times of layoffs and you know the nonsense that's happening in the tech, se the tech sector, like we have to be able to really communicate, hey, the training team, here's how we impact. Here's how we impact the organization. We can say on an individual level, all right, yeah, they learned something. Did it change the behavior? Did, you know, can we at least correlate an uptick in sales conversions? Can we do something to say that what we did was worth everyone's time and effort to create and deploy and pull people away from, um, from taking that training? This is where also like, like this mentality is also where a lot of operational managers get stuck on. We'll just make it an e-learning 
or make it a video because they're they're literally only focusing on how do I make it so a bunch of people don't have to leave their desk working and go to a ILT and just not be productive for the next video? How do I make this like a you know fifteen minute video? All right, Lewis, I see you popped your your head back on. I did. I have a question for you. Yeah, go for it. Because you know, um, I I know you've been you know, um, mentioning operations a lot. Do you have a background in operations at all? Uh, so I don't have a specific background in operations, but before I, I did my journey into finding out that instructional design is like the coolest thing ever, um, I really focused on change management and process improvement and business development. So like focusing in on how can we strategically and tactically change an organization to meet business objectives and how do we move from the old to the new and that's kind of like where i was introduced to instructional to instructional design as a whole is because there are two roads you take to institute change and one is the systematic approach where you get software developers and tool makers and all that other fun stuff and the other half is well there are people that need to also behaviorally change in your organization and who does that um and it's us and the more i started looking into it the more i just kept falling in love with it so although i don't have a specific background in it i have done my formative learning <laughs> on on change management, business process improvement, and like operations. So when you um when you came into uh when you came in, when you started as an instructional designer, we did you get into it knowing that you wanted to have kind of an operations take on the entire process, or was there a specific instance or um or instances that occurred where you were like, I have to shift my perspective now. And if I integrate operational sort of um, ideas into how, you know, my instructional design processes, I'll be much more successful for my organization. I would probably say it was like, once you, once you know it, you can't unknow it. Yeah. So like you kind of learn and start thinking about like, Oh, how can I make that more efficient? Oh, how can I, like communicate on that particular way and when i started getting more involved in the instructional design community as a whole that's where i found out it's like oh this seems to be a missing a missing skill half the time um is that partnership with operations um and then everyone gets really weird when operations is you know asking them to do a million things and it's because they don't think like a trainer does they think like operations does and having that like i think that's helped me out a lot is that i can act as a translator in a lot of instances but also help people understand the language of operations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and and myself like it's all i have a background in operations mm -hmm. Um, but you know, and it, so your intention, like as far as process improvement and that type of thing, um, you know, that is definitely an operational thing because you want to get lean, as lean as possible, do all of that. I would love, I mean, I'm just really curious about how other instructional designers, like even in the audience, if their perception of this, or like if hearing all of this is something new, um, but and is this something typical for the organization that you work for right now for with Amazon? Is that something that you know your team talks about? Um, you know, because it's such a you know it's a big tech company. Yeah. Um, so um, first off, I do want to say that like my opinions are my own, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, kind of going into the Amazon leadership principles of things like dive deep, invent and simplify, and, you know, think big, like all of the leadership principles are always about how do we drive value for our customers. Uh, and if you look up the, like the customer flywheel or the Amazon flywheel, like that is absolutely another aspect that like, the more you keep that in the back of your head while developing and partnering with operational stakeholders, like, it's like, okay, it's starting to make more sense now, like what they care about 
and I need to align with what they care about because that's how I drive value for our end customers um, and stuff. So Amazon functionally is focused on operational stuff because it is, you know, how we drive value for our customers. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that like training teams shouldn't exist, that things like DEI shouldn't exist. Like all these things that some other folks may say like, ah, well, it's a waste of time and money. Like, well, no, again, we act as a force multiplier and there's science now that says, Things like DEI um, uh, actually make make organizations more productive, more thought provoking, more imaginative, uh, and problem solving. And that's the same type of mindset that we also have to have with instructional design. It's just like, how do we be that force multiplier for operations, not just for learning, but for operations? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like Bobby's comment here. Um, Bobby said, the best thing that happened to me as an LXD was being placed on a tr- strategic design team where we blended CX, UX, BPI, PM, LXD, and design thinking, all these different things. Yeah, they would all contribute um, heavily to being a better instructional designer or learning experience designer. So that's very cool, Bobby. Um, Ian, so let me just throw this one at you. If how, I mean, what would you do if you were like an instructional designer? Um, like say in higher ed and you needed to like, you wanted to facilitate this emphasis that you're talking about. Sure. So like in the end, it's always knowing about like, what is the overarching objective, like the, the strategic objective of whatever your organization's trying to do. Um, like I said before, this may not necessarily apply to academia as much because it's not as operationally focused. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't an overarching objective. So let's say higher ed or even like K through 12, like one of the objectives is to create knowledgeable citizens just in general, like raise the bar for just the citizens of you know the country that you know, you're working in and the state and the county and, and, and et cetera. And again, driving that, like what is already like, instead of just thinking about like giving them the whole library, what are the specific books people need? Like we all talk about like pre and post assessments, but like, are we actually using those pre assessments properly instead of it just being a, oh, you're taking a pre assessment and that means you just, you know, you don't need to take the next test or whatever. Instead, it's like, oh, this pre assessment's telling me that like my class, my org, my whatever, um, already knows like the first 20% of this topic. Don't teach that topic build the knowledge on top of what they already know, reinforce it in that new knowledge, anchor it the best way you can, apply good instructional design to the content, but ultimately like only cross the gap that is is there instead of building, you know, the Mackinac Bridge over a creek. Right, right. Do you do any blogging at all? Have you ever written about this operational mindset kind of thing? Uh, I I wrote I wrote an, a very a very poorly written article on Medium. It's like the only thing on my say <laughs> about um, uh, process like process design within instructional design. Um, you know, there's this whole concept of cowboy coding in the software development world. And it's just that like you're building software and you're building solutions without there being any structure around those solutions. So I coined a term called lawless learning, which is basically the same fundamental. It just like, is there structure behind what you're teaching or are you just shotgunning based, you know, from the hip? Um, in hopes that like, oh, well, this provides value because it makes a loud noise and it looks flashy. Um, and it's like, that's that's not good. Um, that's not good either. So like having 
the structure behind how you develop. And this is kind of an expansion on that, where it says like not only having structure, but having purpose behind your team's existence, really from an operational mindset or a strategic level mindset. Love it. Would love to explore that more. That I think that would be a, a really intriguing um, topic to, to, to discuss. Um, let's see, Kim's asking, would applying use cases help us see learning operationally? I would absolutely think so. Um, use cases, uh, especially in, you know, I mean, we have to have use cases for, um, oh my God, I'm blanking, uh, simulations and stuff. Uh, scenario based, wow, scenario, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, scenario based modules and, and stuff like we have to have use cases for there anyway but really kind of look at it from like a, even a marketing perspective. Like I love what Bobby was even saying about like LXD and you're talking about customer experience and user experience and like all these other things like marketing has figured it out. Now, granted it's all profit motive um, and R should be learning motive, but like they've, who are our demographics? Who are we selling to? How are they going to be utilizing this thing that we're giving them so that from a, from marketing that they buy more and know more and engage with our product more? Um, and same thing should go with learning. Like marketing is just behavioral change towards buying and engaging with a particular product uh, so that they can make money. Whereas learning is you know, just focus it on learning. Like it's the same kind of data though. Um, and it is use cases are fantastic for nice. scenario based stuff, but yeah. make it part of your needs analysis, make it part of your ingestion process. What's the use case and what problems are we solving with, with what people are proposing? Like before you can say like, all right, we're storyboarding, we're starting to design, we're starting to figure all that other stuff. Exactly. Make it part of audience analysis so that we have a better idea of like how, what, what is this behavior we're trying to get to and how are people going to interact with even our ideas of training? Mm -hmm. Venny's got this um, question here. Um, is operational mindset the same as performance first approach in ID? <laughs> I would say like, yes and no, um, but I think it's more psychological than what's like written on paper. <laughs> when someone looks at like performance mindset, it's all about like, you know, that grind set mindset coffee is for closers uh, type nonsense, um, which just isn't, you know, it's, it's silly. Um, and like that's that's what operations thinks of typically with uh, with performance based stuff. If you're not meeting performance, you're failing at your job. And we all know that there is a multitude of gray contrast in between those that binary statement. Um, and that's where like operations would know more of that if training teams partnered with their operational stakeholders and leaders better and helped communicate the behavior of workers in general. Um, Cause we know, we know, like we should know better the behaviors of individual workers um, and how they learn and how they interact with e each other and how they just engage with the work they do because we have to optimize it. Um, whereas operational stakeholders and leaders have to focus more on meeting those KPIs and optimizing the business, which includes standard operating procedures and policies and all that other fun stuff. They have to look at it from a higher level than just the individual at all times to meet their objectives. So we're there to help consult, um, to consult them on just how people are going to be interacting with some of this stuff and this, this change. Now, if, if you're, also lucky to have a change management team. They're supposed to help out a ton. Um, but like remind your operational stakeholders that like empathy is a good thing. Having feelings makes you human. Don't don't go that route. <laughs> 
That's great. Yeah, and this is, I mean, we've hit our time, but I, yeah. this is a great conversation. This is really intriguing. Um, I can, I mean, with the, the, the chat and everything, definitely some great stuff here. Um, Kim saying, I'm even wondering mm -hmm. if what I learned about writing software requirements might apply for our deliverables using jargon from ops might help us communicate with them and get approval for budget. If, a bazillion percent because their own, I mean, like they build their documents on operational uh, terminology. Like they build their budgets out. And especially if you're tied to the budget of an operational team, if you want any of that budget, you're going to have to speak their language more than the instructional design language. Um, because that's, that's like, we know this terminology because we work it every day. They don't work it every day. They've got other things to also worry about on top of whether the behavior of the business in performance is being met behaviorally. So force multiply. And maybe that's where we need negotiating training <laughs> uh, instead of the sales team. Like, that's a, that's a gap in behavior and instructional design teams is negotiating. So like, maybe don't give it to the salespeople, give it to the IDs. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ian, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. It, it seems like it's something that, uh, that we can talk about more. Um, oh, absolutely. Really cool session today. Appreciate the pragmatic approach a lot. Um, this is good stuff. Where can people find you? You're no longer on Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn primarily. Um, you can always email me at me at I'm Ian Crook .com. Me, I am um, .com. Yeah, but uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place to reach me. Um, and just ping me there. Otherwise, email me. Um, kind of figuring out where I live now, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I, th I don't think you're alone there. Yeah, um, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, until blue sky, what is it? Is it blue sky? What's the the one? Yeah, blue can... sky is the new one by Jack Dorsey. Um, I've signed up for it. There's also like Mastodon, which is yeah. like a decentralized Twitter. Yeah, yeah. like I, I don't know. It's it's like that weird in between of like MySpace and Facebook showing up, <laughs> and but instead, like everyone is way more ingrained in the internet now, so we don't necessarily know how this is going to explode in our faces culturally mm -hmm. or we have and just it doesn't look good so far yeah. <laughs> we'll just have to ask chat gpt and i'm sure that that's uh, exactly it'll have an answer right. all right <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today ian let's let's do this again we have to do this again um so glad that i reached out with my uh with my little email out to everybody and yeah we had so we had this opportunity to talk but um you obviously have a ton of wisdom in um in the L D space so um it'd be wonderful if you could share more of it at some point soon so let's get together again yeah awesome okay. yeah i like that idea all right <laughs> thanks everybody thanks again ian um wednesday we have a member showcase liz stefan from nifty learning liz also has a podcast called L D spotlight so we'll be talking to liz on wednesday and then friday we have another member showcase guest i can't remember first name trista trist tris hennessy vrar stuff so that'll be fun too um so a couple more times this week we're getting together and hopefully we'll see you then thanks again ian bye everybody